director of North, the Northwestern Buffett Institute for Global Affairs. Um, welcome to the final session of our Confronting COVID-19 series that we have been running for several months. Uh, one lesson that we have learned over the course of those months is that neither does the virus spread evenly, nor is everyone in the population exposed to the same risk. Uh, we learn about hotspots such as nursing homes, food processing plants, and prisons. Um, and the risk um, posed by COVID um, has everything to do with how our societies are organized and where they put people in what conditions. And while this is a universal truth, our session today focuses on one example that is very close to home. Uh, the U.S. now holds over 20% of the world's incarceration population, uh, with over 2.2 million people currently in U.S. prisons and jails. And so it's perhaps no surprise that five of the U.S. Uh, top 10 hotspots are prisons and jails, including Chicago's very own Cook County Jail. Today, our speakers will address the question, what can we learn about pandemics and public health in prisons from the country with the world's uh, larger prison population? So I'm very pleased to introduce our, our panel today. And I think it's a, it's a very exciting panel to me. Um, Jennifer Lackey is uh, the Wayne and Elizabeth Jones uh, Professor of Philosophy at Northwestern. She also directs the Northwestern Prison Education Program. She's a specialist in epistemology, um, and her recent work focuses on false confessions, the criminal justice system, uh, the duty of uh, the duty to object, uh, norms of credibility, and the epistemic status of punishment. Jennifer is joined by Alan Mills, who's the executive director of the Uptown People's Law Center in Chicago. He started there in uh, 1979 while attending Northwestern University Law School and served as a staff attorney um, and became uh, uh, legal director and then executive director. Uh, the UPLC advocates for prisoners, tenants, and disabled people that are denied public benefits. Our third panelist um, is uh, Antonio McDowell, and we're especially lucky to have him here with us today. Uh, born and raised in the Austin area of uh, Chicago's West Side, Antonio was arrested at age 21 and spent 23 years in Menard and Stateville Correctional Centers. Uh, in 2018, while incarcerated at Stateville, Antonio completed his GED and within a month um, applied for a newly created Northwestern Prison Education Program uh, that Jennifer now directs. Um, um, he was offered a place in the very first cohort and during his tenure has completed one and three quarters of college level Northwestern classes. He's also selected as one of the featured playwrights for the Goodman Theater and he survived the COVID-19 outbreak in Stateville. Uh, so what better panel uh, to talk about um, uh, COVID in uh, prison context? Um, welcome Jennifer, Alan and Antonio and thank you so much for uh, being with us today. I turn it over to Jennifer, I believe, who starts us out. So. Thank you, Klaus. Um, so it's really a pleasure to be here. And um, I'm delighted, especially, to be speaking with my fellow panelists. Um, so um, we're going to break down um, what we focus on. Um, I'm, I'm going to focus primarily on um, the causes and consequences of what makes the combination of um, COVID-19 and prisons, such a lethal combination. Um, Antonio is going to speak to his um, firsthand experience um, living through the outbreak, and then Alan will focus more on um, steps forward. So I'm going to limit my remarks on how to respond to this lethal combination, um, since Alan will be focusing mostly on that. So um, the United States is unfortunately the global leader in incarceration rates, in COVID-19 rates, and in COVID-19 rates among incarcerated populations. So the American criminal justice system holds almost 2.3 million people. And um, to put this in a bit of a global context, we have the world's highest incarceration rate and it is five to 18 times higher than those in other liberal democracies. So if you see the chart um, per 100,000 um, members of the population, the United States is at 698 um, with the United Kingdom at 139 and you can follow the chart all the way down to Iceland, which is at 38. So we are um, not just a global leader in incarceration rates, but a major global leader. 
Uh, the United States is home to 5% of the world's population, but 25% of its incarcerated population. And we have more total people who are incarcerated than any other country in the world. So this is just a bit of a breakdown um, of this, the population. So we see that the bulk of people who are incarcerated in the United States um, are in state prisons, um, followed by local jails and then federal prisons and jails. We also know that incarceration does not um, target members of our population um, in any sort of equal way. So the Bureau of Justice reports that one in three young black American males is expected to go to jail or prison during his lifetime. And black men account for roughly 6.5% of the US population, but they make up 40.2% of the prison population. So the lifetime chance of being sent to prison um, at current US incarceration rates for all Americans, it's about 6%. And for African American men, it's about 32% followed by, you can see, Hispanic men um, at 17%. So um, the United States, as we know, is also the leader in COVID-19 rates um, by, by a long margin. So we currently have almost 2.7 million cases. Um, and we can see that um, most other uh, countries, you know, aren't even um, close to a million cases. So, um, so we're also a global leader in COVID-19. Um, unsurprisingly, given that combination, we are also the global leader in um, COVID-19 cases and deaths. So this is um, a global map of current um, numbers. So there are 84,971 cases. Um, of COVID-19 COVID positive cases among prisoners in 85 countries. Now, of course, these are either confirmed or leaked reports. Um, we know that there is massive, um, you know, kind of failure to do appropriate testing um, across the globe. So there's no, these numbers are, are, are extremely low relative to what we would expect to be finding. Um, but in terms of confirmed cases and leaked reports, um, the United States comes out as um, head and shoulders above anyone else. So there's 84,971 confirmed cases, and the USA um, it has 61,943 of those cases. The um, country following us is Brazil at 4,472. So, um, you know, an enormous disparity. So specifically in prisons, as of June 23rd, there were at least 48,764 incarcerated people um, who attested positive for COVID-19. And I think it's important to note that this is a 5% increase from the week before. So we see numbers going up um, in recent weeks. And at least 585 incarcerated people have died from the virus um, in US prisons. And that's a 7% increase from the week before. Um, and there have been at least 10,342 cases of um, coronavirus among prison staff with 42 reported deaths. Again, we know that these numbers are low. And I think this chart would um, kind of help make that clear. Um, we can see the extremely high rates. So these are the positive test results out of all incarcerated people um, who were tested in facilities with widespread or universal testing. So we see incredibly high rates when testing is being done in prisons and jails. And we see, for instance, Cook County Jail um, is at a 40% um, positive test result um, rate um, with you know, so two of the correctional um, centers in Ohio you know, approaching 90%. So the natural question we'd want to ask is, why is COVID-19 so deadly in prisons? Why um, do we see such high rates? Why are um, some of the you know, kind of nation's um, hotspots in jails and prisons? What are some of the conditions that are leading to this deadly combination? So the first, um, I think, is not news, and that's um, overcrowded facilities. So um, prisons across the globe are overcrowded, and the United States is certainly not immune to that. 17 states 
um, have more prisoners than their facilities are designed to hold, with Illinois being um, right up there among them. So um, obviously when um, there are more people who are incarcerated than the facilities were designed to hold, that means that you know, more people are packed into smaller spaces um, and there is no possibility of social distancing. So just to kind of get a global perspective, here are some of the world's most overcrowded prison systems. We see some of them at you know, kind of 454% um, of the, uh, the capacity. Um, the United States is over its capacity. Um, it's, it's at 103.9%. But we know that there are at least um, 125 countries uh, in the world that have massive overcrowding um, issues in prisons. So this is a global problem and one that the United States is also reckoning with. So in addition to the um, overcrowdedness of the prisons, obviously um, many people who are incarcerated are in extremely close proximity to others. And so there's an inability to practice social distancing. Here's a picture of a standard cell. Um, the average prison cell in the United States for two people is six by eight. And um, in a standard cell, you know, you have, um, you, as you can see, like bunk beds, um, the toilet and the sink are right next to the bunk beds. There's no space. If both people are standing up at the same time, you can't even really not bump into one another. Um, so, you know, there's, you know, as we've been hearing, all of the um, recommendations are staying six feet apart and social distancing. Um, when you're in these kinds of conditions, there's no possibility for following those, um, you know, recommendations. Um, there's also a lack, oops, sorry, um, a lack of PPE, proper sanitation and hygiene products. So many prisons did not or still do not have appropriate PPE. So um, we at the Northwestern Prison Education Program um, worked really hard at the beginning of the COVID-19 outbreak to donate um, thousands of bars of soap and um, gallons of hand sanitizer and masks because um, many of the facilities did not have adequate PPE. Many cells, as I've said, have the sink and toilet inches from where incarcerated people sleep. Hand sanitizer is not allowed in many prison cells due to the high alcohol content and high pro um, hygiene products are minimal. For instance, um, during the COVID-19 outbreaks, people, you know, oftentimes would get one bar of soap for all of their cleaning needs. Age is a significant factor. Almost 20% of the U.S. population is over the age of 50. And many people who are incarcerated have pre-existing conditions. So a third of the 175,000 people in federal prisons have pre-existing conditions, a third. At least 40% of people incarcerated in the U.S. suffer from some chronic health condition. And incarcerated Americans are five times more likely than the, than the general population to have a serious mental illness. Two thirds of incarcerated Americans have a substance use disorder. So there's lots of pre-existing conditions that also make people who are incarcerated particularly vulnerable to COVID-19. There's also a lack of adequate medical care. Um, health care in prisons is frequently described as abysmal. Um, a Bureau of Justice statistics report revealed, for instance, that a thousand people who died in local jails in 2016, over half of these were preventable, and the other half were from illness, many of which could have been prevented or treated with adequate health care. Um, I'm going to skip the Illinois slide because I only have a couple of more minutes, and I know Alan will focus on that. Um, so. Um, since I only have about, uh, actually, I'm over time. So, um, the, so all of these, so these factors, um, overcrowdedness, inability to social distance, small spaces, age, inadequate health care, um, have combined to, um, to make the combination of incarceration and COVID-19 a humanitarian crisis. So there are 11 million people incarcerated worldwide. Um, prisons, as we can see, are petri dishes. So the picture on your screen is a prison in Brazil. Um, they are petri dishes for COVID-19. And um, as many, um, you know, kind of, you know, human rights advocates have said, prison sentences should not be death sentences. And so the United Nations has said that this is a grave, urgent humanitarian crisis, a life-threatening situation which obliges, obliges states to take immediate action to avert otherwise probable but preventable loss of life. And so the burden of the state is set out by existing international human rights norms. These were some laid out by the United Nations, that the right to life of all people who are incarcerated must be upheld, 
Adequate measures must be taken to protect people who are incarcerated from arbitrary death. The state bears a heightened duty of care to those whom it incarcerates. Adequate provision of health care without discrimination must be ensured. And a continuity of access to health care must be provided. Now, I'm a philosopher, so I would be remiss if I didn't end on a moral note. I think that um, the COVID-19 crisis is challenging us to examine and confront the systemic racism, inequities, and moral failures of the United States criminal justice system. The recent deaths of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Tony McDade, and other Black Americans at the hands of police violence have ignited a global reckoning with America's pernicious investment in policing, criminalization, and incarceration. And so the failure to adequately address the COVID-19 crisis, especially as it has devastated vulnerable communities such as prison populations, reveals the nation's prioritizing of some lives over others. But I think that as a nation, we can divest from the systems that have led to this national crisis and invest in the values that will truly make our communities flourish, such as education, healthcare, and support services. So I think that we can together um, accept an invitation to rethink what justice and accountability demands, and in so doing, to reimagine what's possible. Thanks. <laughs> Antonio, I think you're up next. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Yeah, I'm here to talk about my experiences with the coronavirus in Stateville. Um, it's a real dark, dark reality. As an African-American man faced with these, these decisions to try to be healthy, opposed to, let me say, let me just be real with this interview. That's this is how I want to put this interview. Stateville neglected the people in, in, in their prisons. African Americans were suffering equally in the communities and in the prisons. We have a very poor health care system in Stateville, and Stateville is one of the more older prisons in Illinois. And so the structure with COVID and the living conditions combined, it made for such a scary experience. I was in Delta House, and I don't know if it's good for me to say it or not, but I was in Delta House, and in the very beginning stages of the coronavirus, no one understood it, as no one understood it in the world. However, we had the symptoms of loss of taste, and we couldn't smell, but it was spread it out throughout the entire cell house, and even the COs were experiencing the same symptoms. But at this time, it was not a COVID symptom. And so they would say, well, don't worry about that. This is what the healthcare would say. Don't worry about that. Everybody experiencing it. It's just some type of cold going around. But it was more than a cold because shortly after that in Delta House, you had a, a number of people being rushed out. They went from not being able to, to smell and taste to not being able to breathe. And we watch our peers in the prisons being rushed out. And imagine getting the words of them saying that this individual passed away. People whom you see every day. Anxiety that goes with being in prison, thinking that perhaps you're going to die. You are going to died no one understood it and so now everyone is afraid and so they say okay well we're going to quarantine everyone this was a quarantine like no other quarantine in the history of america they allowed the workers to come out and mingle to pass out food and to do everything with everybody in the cell house so now that we know how the coronavirus response to to people who have it and how they give it out we were never safe there was never a quarantine so if it's on my rubber glove and i'm moving your tray to this cell and the next tray to the next cell and we already in the conjugate setting we breathe out and inhale the exact same air the exact same disease or the exact same virus 
we was doomed. And so imagine watching on the news every day or the 230 report from the governor every day. And they're saying that all of these things are being done. But when it came down to it, the PPE was missing Stateville. They would give out a hand, a hotel sized bar of soap. And it was to last for a week. They went the entire uh, um, three months that I, that, that I had to get in there without cleaning the place. So no one came to spread down and they would get upset. All they did was take your temperature. So you say, well, I want to be tested. But the, the things needed for testing wasn't there. But they were making all of these reports as if, oh, we got Tent City. But well, here's the thing about Tent City. They were allowing people to go who had certain symptoms. And they would go there for two weeks. And then they would return them right back to the exact same cell without being tested. And so it was continuously spreading throughout the cell houses. And then more and more people began to die. More and more people began to get sick. But more and more people became needing to see the site because of the anxiety levels were so high. Me being a person who was diagnosed with sarcoidosis, a respiratory illness, you can imagine how I was feeling to hear them say, oh, those who have compromising uh, uh, um, respiratory problems are at high risk. So every day I'm thinking like, perhaps if this person coughs too, too loud, maybe it'll blow the virus over into my cell because he's right next door to me. And so it was a fear. It's a fear that the people who work there didn't take serious because the world as we know it has not experienced a pandemic in our lifetimes. And so people in Stateville were downsizing. They was downplaying it because we didn't know much about it and the education wasn't there. So it was people were going about their everyday business. All they know is that we're on the quarantine. But during the quarantine, you run in showers. And it's only eight shower heads, but you put 12 people in there. In the conjugate setting. So when you when you look at that in combination with the lack of ventilation, we were we were destined to become sick. It pained me to think about the numbers. They were saying that, oh, Stateville is under control. Stateville is under control. But Stateville was not under control. Stateville was screaming, loud screams that no one could hear. No one could hear. It wasn't until a protest that happened outside of the prison that the guards began to take it serious. It wasn't until news meteors got involved and people began to realize that we can't let them down because, not because we care, but because all eyes are on us. So we have to pretend to care. We have to pretend that we're taking care of these individuals. But no one really came to see about us. It wasn't until the National Guards came that they even began to do rounds. So then they'll run the cell houses, every cell house. However, the only thing that they were doing was giving you temperature checks. And we know that a temperature check don't determine whether or not you're coronavirus free. And so people guards began to let down the guards, guards was letting was let down. And so they were getting restless because they had to do more work. And so you can't tell a person who's getting all they, they paychecks for free to work. So now they want to let people run around and let people continue to pass this virus from individual to individual and pretend that, oh, it's under control. I watched some of my, my classmates in MPEP 
become sick in which they had to go into tent city in which you know the anxiety behind that for their peers we were thinking like man all the good that these people are trying to do and here come a pandemic and we got to make sure that they safe so now we worrying about the people in impact we worrying about the other prison population of people and people whom we've seen and known for many years we've seen them dying we've seen them me personally i did 23 years so i seen a lot of them when they was young and, and energetic until when they was old and fragile and then to see them fall down to a virus and die it's disheartening it's disheartening it was really sad and if anybody out there can help i encourage them to do so i encourage them to not turn a blind eye because of what society said these people did and I'm not taking up for what no one did. I'm, I'm not talking about any one cases. I'm talking about human beings, all equal, all deserving to live, all deserving to be healthy. And we need as many people to check on them because they are forgotten. They forgotten just like the black communities was forgetting, was forgotten from where I come from. I came home to a real, real, ran down environment in which I still live. And so I had to watch, I had to, I got one minute, I had to watch the people out there suffering. And it reminds me of the people inside suffering. And so we need as much attention brought to this situation as possible. And I don't think that it should be forgotten. And, and that's my time, I'm gonna give it to Alan. Thanks, Antonio. Was, uh, not sure. I'm not sure I can top that at all. Uh, I guess I, I'm trying to hit somewhere between Jennifer's uh, worldview and Antonio's um, in the cell view. Um, so I've got a few pictures, uh, which I guess I'll try to share here. Let me see if I can make this work. Uh, okay. Um, as Jennifer said, you know, a lot of people in prison, and what's maybe not so obvious is how different this is than uh, has been true throughout the history of the United States. Um, she talked some about how different it was from other countries, but it's also very different from our country has ever been before. Uh, we now incarcerate something like seven times as many people as we did in the 1970s, uh, and it has nothing to do with the crime rate. So we have a huge number of people in prison uh, and in jail. Uh, in ways that had never been seen before anywhere in the world, anywhere in the history of the world. Um, this, uh, this mass incarceration experiment that we're in the middle of is not evenly uh, distributed among the population. As you can see here, uh, the risk of imprisonment is vastly larger uh, for young black men than it is for young white men. Uh, and that remains true even among college graduates. Uh, obviously, you're much less likely to go to prison if you have a college degree, but um, the gap between black and white stays about five to one uh, in terms of our, our incarceration. So uh, this is an experiment that has been uh, largely focused on young black men. Uh, Brain at home to Illinois, what does this huge increase mean? means that we have a lot of people in our prison system. Uh, generously, the system was designed for 31,000 people. And when I say generously, I'm talking about bed space. You talk about things like the number of classrooms, if you talk about the number of showers, if you talk about uh, the number of doctors, the number of mental health professionals, uh, vocational training, all those things, it comes nowhere near 31,000. At our peak, Illinois had almost 50,000 people in prison back in 2015. Uh, through some hard work of a lot of people, that number is down. Uh, it's now a little less than 35,000, uh, but 35,000 is still more than 31,000. So this is still an overcrowded system. Uh, Jennifer talked about how some of those cells are very small. Um, she said the average one is six by eight. The one she actually showed a picture of at Menard, and this is another one at Menard, um, is actually four and a half by 10 feet. So as she said, both people can stand up in that cell. They both can't move around at the same time. There's a bunk bed in this particular one, so you're only seeing the, the ground floor. But I'm trying to give you a closer view of what some of these very old cells look like. Uh, Jennifer talked about Stateville being one of her older prisons. In fact, uh, Stateville, Menard, and Pontiac 
all were built in the 1920s or earlier. Menard was actually started uh, back in the 1800s. So uh, Illinois is unique among states in that all of its maximum security prisons are way past their useful life. Uh, Stateville, there's a study done in 1970 saying they should close it down, that it was decrepit then. Instead, we stuffed twice as many people in it. So it's not at all surprising that at the moment it's in terrible shape. You talk about individual cells, but you really don't get the overview until you walk into a cell house and look at the entire cell house at once. Uh, and this is a five story uh, cell house where there are about 50 cells per floor. So you're talking about 500 people all packed together in those tiny little cells, two to a cell. So no, you can't social distance in those cells, but even your neighbor, either above you or below you, uh, or on both sides are also within six feet of you. So there's simply no way uh, that you're talking about any kind of social distancing at all. We are warehousing, uh, again, largely black men in uh, deplorable conditions under the best of circumstances. Uh, Antonio briefly mentioned the National Guard coming in, and I think it's important to understand why that happened. Uh, Illinois is unique among the states uh, as to how little we spend on medical care. Uh, this is a comparison of three states. California, uh, the highest in the country, spends just under $20,000 per prisoner. When about a decade ago, Illinois was actually number 49 among the 50 states. We're now clawed away up to about 43 among the states. And as you can see here, the gap is not just marginal. Um, we spend about one fifth of what California spends per prisoner on our medical care. And we get exactly what we pay for. And in case you think that California is like a Cadillac of, of medical care, in fact, California is the state where the Supreme Court held five years ago that medical care was so bad there that it could not be fixed. And that the only solution was to let people go. So even California at almost $20,000 per prisoner is not providing constitutionally adequate medical care. Illinois is far, far away. Uh, about a year ago, we settled a class action lawsuit we brought and entered into an agreement, which the department said would take 10 years to come up to a constitutional uh, minimum uh, in terms of providing medical care. Well, the coronavirus didn't give us a decade. Um, it gave us less than a year. Uh, as you can see here, the number of cases in the IDOC skyrocketed in late March. Most of that skyrocketing happened initially at Stateville. Uh, since then, other prisons have continued to go up uh, a little bit at a time until a week ago, at which point East Moline became the new basket case. Uh, East Moline exploded over the last two weeks from zero cases to now just under 75 cases. And those are confirmed positive tests. It's really important to understand that Illinois has not tested anywhere near everybody in its prison. Uh, I believe we've tested less than 1,000 people out of the 35,000 or so that are in prison in Illinois. So we're talking about a tiny proportion of people that have actually been tested. So these numbers that I'm showing on our graphs are clearly higher than, the, than what's shown here in terms of the people that actually are infected with coronavirus. Um, so how do we move forward? Um, how, how do we solve this problem in our prison system? It seems overwhelming, and in some ways it is. Uh, we are a litigation firm. We sue the Department of Corrections all the time. We have uh, six class action cases pending against the Department of Corrections, including the medical care case I talked about. Uh, when this started, uh, we joined with, uh, with several other organizations. Sorry, this slide got all messed up, um, including Northwestern University's uh, Legal Clinic and the MacArthur Justice Center. Uh, Lobby and Lobby and Equip for Equality uh, to bring a class action case saying the Department of Corrections is not doing enough to keep its prisoners safe. We identified five existing ways under the law uh, that they could reduce the number of people in prison. Uh, the governor has the right to give anybody clemency they want to uh, for any reason at all at any time. He has, in fact, released something like 15 people, uh, including obviously Antonio, um, uh, using that power over, since the coronavirus started. Uh, the, the Department of Corrections itself, without the governor's action at all, uh, has the right to restore up to 180 days of good time uh, in order to reduce its prison population. There's some limitations on who those can be given to, but most prisoners are eligible for this restoration of good time. They also have the ability to let people out early on electronic monitoring or home detention. 
anybody has a class two, three, or four felony, and that's basically not murder or other um, very serious crimes like uh, aggravated sexual assault, uh, attempted murder, those can spend their entire sentences at home if they want to, if the department wants them to. The, the legislature has given that discretion to let anybody out who's a two, three, or four felony. Anybody with any sentence uh, other than sex offenses uh, who has 55 years or more, who is 55 years or more old um, and has less than a year left on, to do on their sentence can be let out. Finally, there's medical furlough. Uh, originally, that was meant for people who need to go out to the hospital for treatment in a relatively short amount of time and then come back to prison. The governor lifted that that uh, limitation on medical furlough as one of his executive orders during this pandemic, and it said that anybody who needs to be transferred out of a prison for medical reasons can be done so to somewhere that they can be kept safe. Now, that could be an outside facility, but it could also be their house uh, so that they're not in this Petri dish. Our estimates are that between 10 and 15,000 people are eligible for release under one of these uh, criteria. Clemency, obviously, everybody's eligible. But in fact, the state of Illinois has released less than 1,000 people. So that's really where our lawsuit is focused on, is that the state should be using more of the tools that the legislature already gave them uh, to let people out. The final point I want to make is that just like the prison system itself is not uh, racially equitable at all, neither is the releases uh, that have happened so far. So. The prison population is, is majority black. However, when we look at the number of people that have had good time restored, and that's the vast majority of people who've gotten out early, um, they've restored usually less than less than uh, 90 days. Uh, so people are getting out a couple months early from their sentences. Of the people that have had good time restored, over half have been white. So just like the prison system itself is racially discriminatory, whites are also much much more likely, about twice as likely to get out of prison under this new, uh, new regime where they're releasing a few people early than our black people. That's an issue that has to be solved. Uh, you might say, well, maybe people are, are maybe the medically vulnerable population uh, is overwhelmingly white. That's not true. We did a breakdown. And again, black people are over, are over half or almost half of the medically vulnerable as well yet nowhere near half of the people that are going out. So it's nothing to do with who's medically vulnerable. It has everything to do with race. What else could they be doing? Uh, universal testing would be a good idea. Uh, they should be testing every prisoner. They should be testing every staff person. They should be doing contact tracing. Anytime anybody tests positive, they need to go through and test everybody they've been in contact with for the last 14 days. They need to do social distancing. They need to get enough people out so you can have single cells. They need to get enough people out so you can go to the yard. Um, what we're doing now is essentially keeping people in solitary in order to keep them safe. That's not a medical solution. That is something that in and of itself is going to cause long-term harm. I'm concerned that even after the virus passes, we have thousands of people in the state right now who are locked in their cells 24 hours a day, not because they've done anything wrong, but because we're doing it for so-called medical reasons. United Nations says over 15 days in solitary can cause serious long-term effects so that it's considered torture. We've now kept most of the population of our entire prison system in solitary for three months, going on four months now. This may, uh, I worry as to what the long-term consequences of that are gonna be long after COVID-19 is gone. So ultimately, what's the solution? The only solution is to unwind this monster that we've released wind it back down so that we're where we were in 1970 or perhaps even smaller. So I'm hoping that, you know, 50, 100 years from now, people look back at this period of history and say, what in the world were those people thinking? They must have been insane. And that's, uh, that's where I leave you. You just need to get rid of people out of prison. That really is ultimately the only solution. I wish I had a magic uh, formula uh, for getting rid of uh, coronavirus in prison, but I don't. We need to close them. Klaus, we can't hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes. Thank you. 
Um, thank you so much, um, all three of you, for um, a you know really insightful and and very um, fantastic uh, presentation. We have a, a number of questions from our audience, and so I, I will just sort of go through them in um, hopefully some meaningfully sensible order. Uh, one I think is is more of a clarification, um, and it is simply what does it mean to restore good time, which was on one of uh, your slides. Um, so I think I muted myself. Uh, I'm, I'm okay. Um, so most people who are serving time in Illinois prisons um, have uh, what what are known as 50% sentences. So if they're sentenced to five years, then they're given half of their time. Um, if every day that they do in prison without violating any sort of rules is a day knocked off that sentence. So in theory, they spend uh, two and a half years in prison. Uh, people lose good time for all kinds of reasons uh, that can be restored so that, in fact, they're only doing the half of their sentence. The legislature has actually said for good reason, the Department of Corrections give back even more time, like an extra 180 days, and let people out six months earlier than they would otherwise get out. So basically, it's a mechanism for allowing people to go home early. It doesn't shorten their sentence. It just shortens the amount of their sentence that they spend inside prison rather than on what's colloquially known as parole. Thank you. Um, we had several questions that um, sort of look at the um, the ways to, I guess, the points of leverage to to get to a point where uh, this crisis is being addressed. And um, if we don't want to wait until you know 2050, um, <laughs> what 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 are the because um, you mentioned several sort of legal sort of approaches um, that seem to be taking a long time. Um, what, what are the sort of points of leverage to actually affect this change at, at, at this point in time, and, and why is it not happening? Uh, I guess all of us can answer that one. Yeah, all of you can answer that. Yeah. Jennifer, you want to start, take, start with that? Can oh. you hear me? There you go. Okay. Um, so I'll start. Um, more big picture because I think that um, Alan and Antonio will be really well positioned to speak to some very specific um, issues. So I think that, um, you know, this is not going to happen, you know, so, so the question is about short term. This is something that we can start kind of dealing with short term, but it is going to take some time. Um, and that's just like reconceiving of what, how we hold people accountable. Um, I mean, at a very deep level, I think that this nation needs to reckon with how they understand punishment and how they understand accountability. Um, we uh, just the very, you know, kind of the way in which we um, we've built these systems um, that are solely punitive um, and don't provide any of the needs that just human beings need um, is something that we need to kind of, I think, from a moral point of view, from a humanitarian point of view, from a political point of view, and from a legal point of view, we need to just kind of rethink. Because once we start rethinking this, and we see this happening with policing, right? I mean, I think that this webinar comes at a, a very, I think, good time because there is, unlike anything I've seen before, a real national reckoning with what policing is. And I think that terms like abolishing police or defunding police were not part of a common conversation, you know, months ago. And now it is part of the conversation. And I think that we need to do this, have the same kind of conversation about punishment and incarceration more, more broadly. Um, you know, just to kind of put in a plug for, you know, kind of what we do here at Northwestern, the prison education program, it's a real long, it's a, a long road, right? So, I mean, within the context of the prison system, we really look upon our work as harm mitigation within this kind of, you know, kind of the system that is um, something that needs to be um, kind of radically rethought. And so um, one of the things I, that I think Northwestern can do and we have been trying to do is to provide um, all of the data shows that providing people who are incarcerated with an education is one of the most successful ways of intervening in the criminal justice system. So while we recognize that this is a long term goal and also something that is just mitigating harm within a system that needs to be rethought, um, that is part of like the, the mission of our work. Alan, you're on mute if you were trying to speak.
Mm -hmm. Got it, Antonio? Oh, oh, um, <laughs> I thought you were finna say something. But one thing I want to say is that how do you reverse hatred? The hatred that you gave to a whole a whole people. If you want to punish punish us, you taught us to be punished. You taught people to punish us just based off our presence. And so to reverse that, it's not gonna be something that could be done overnight. You know, um, there's a lot of privilege out there. And so now we need people who are privileged to come forward and make a real strong stance. Because it, my experience is being hated just because I exist. And so that's a punishment. That's a psychological punishment. And so we got to deal with the psychological effects of, of, of prisons just the same. You know, to... to even though all the things that we are doing today is 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 commendable, but we need real change. And I also want to add that with that hundred percent, with with the hundred percent, you don't get good time. And so most people that's been incarcerated after June nineteenth of nineteen ninety eight, they are being punished to another level. So you could do nothing to earn good time. And there's a lot of people in MPEP that earn good time, but can't receive it. And so I think that we should, at least in the very least, start by reversing that. Give people an opportunity to go home. You got 100% on the table. So that's saying, like, if you get 40 years and you 25, that's pretty much a, a, a death sentence, a life sentence. So we had, we had a lot of work ahead of us and we need to encourage all listeners to join in with us to help us find some type of resolution, some type of cure for this hatred. And bag me up on this, Alan. All right, so I, I agree with everything that both Antonio and Jennifer said, and I wanna, but I wanna bring it down even more narrowly here. Uh, yeah. In terms of the COVID-19 itself, what can you do? Testing, testing, testing. That's got to be the answer. Um, until we know how broadly it's spread in the prison system, there's no way we can protect it from spreading further. It just cannot be done. Uh, you know, we, you know, Statefoot was horrible, no question about it. And one day we ended up with seven people on ventilators without any prior, prior knowledge anything was wrong at all. That flooded the local hospital, it closed it down to anybody else. In a sense, it was lucky it happened to say, fellow, it's located in Joliet, near Chicago, one of the best medically served communities in the entire country. Think about Menard Correctional Center, which is about twice as big as Stateville. The number of ICU beds in the entire county, in the entire Randolph County where Menard is located, is two. So imagine if what happened to Stateville had happened at Menard. We would have closed down not just Menard's healthcare unit, not just the counties, but the entire Southern Illinois. Public health care would have crashed. And we have no idea how many people at Menard have, in fact, been exposed to COVID-19 because we're not testing. So you need to do testing of every single prisoner. You have to do regular testing of guards who walk through the front door every day because they're the main vectors that are bringing it in from the outside communities. And then you've got to do contact tracing. Anytime anybody tests positive, You've got to figure out who has that guard been in contact with over the last 14 days and retest all of them. So testing, testing, testing is the only way that we're going to stay on top of this. It's the only way we're going to stop it from spreading. And let me say one more thing about solitary. I'm sorry, I'm sort of on a solitary kick, but I spent my whole life fighting against solitary in, in Illinois. Um, putting people in F House, which is what we're doing now to isolate them in Stateville, that's the old roundhouse, which was closed down many years ago as uninhabitable. When you test, when you say I have the symptoms, they put you in that house. What that does is dissuade people from saying they have symptoms. They want to hide the fact they have symptoms. We should be encouraging people to come forward when they feel sick, not threatening to punish them by throwing them in the worst prison cells in the entire state. So testing, 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 and then when you test positive, put them in a medical environment, not in a punitive environment. Those are my short-term solutions. And the governor has announced Everybody in the entire state who wants to get tested can now get tested. Well, that is not true in our prison system, and it ought to be. Uh, so 
Make it real. Make what the governor said real. It's not anything new. It's already the policy of the state. We just have to carry it out inside the prison, just like you on the outside of the prison. I'll get off my soapbox and I'll have something else. Go one by one. One is the more immediate um, one that is about um, what can we do now. The other one is the more systemic one that that, that I think we also want to address. So let me get to the, the the what can we do now. There are several questions. So I'm a college student. What can I do to help? Um, where do I need to send my petition? Where? What are the right channels for me to get involved? Um, can you speak to that? Um, I'll start. Uh, I think there's two targets. The governor, um, he ultimately controls the prison system, and um, you know he said a lot of the right things about what should happen in prison, but they're not actually being done. So the more pressure that's on the governor that there are people out here who care, the better off we are. And I always say you should be contacting your state legislator. Wherever you are living, you have a state legislature in the state of Illinois, contact them. Uh, they will always tell me when I go down and ask for some change in the prison system, that we never hear from anybody who says that they care about prisoners. All they hear from is people that Antonio talked about saying, we need to lock up more people. Crime is too high, lock up more people. They need to hear from that other side. There are lots of people in the legislature who understand the problem or could understand the problem if you took the time to study it, but there's no political upside to doing so right now. Uh, as somebody told me in the legislature, nobody has ever lost an election because they're too tough on crime. Um, we need to make it so people are worried about losing elections because it's up on crime. And the only way to do that is to flood their offices with telephone calls, emails, whatever you can do to get to them. And if possible, we could provide some resources um, that could be sent around. I mean, because there are lots of, um, I mean, it's someone asked specifically about petitions. There are a lot of really um, important petitions and proposals that are being sent to the governor these days in Illinois. Um, and so I'm sure Alan, Antonio, and I um, would be happy to put together some resources to circulate if that's possible. Sure, I think that'd be great. Because uh, there were quite a few of those type of questions. Um... Um, I want to sort of turn to the to the other side that I think all of you have already addressed, and I, I was particularly struck by by Antonio what you said about the, the being hated um, as um, as as who you are, and the, the, there's a question about how we generally uh, in the society see or think of people that are in the criminal justice system that are incarcerated. Um, and whether there's a, a sort of a that's fundamentally wrong or that sort of um, makes us stay away from solutions that would otherwise be be sensible. So that I guess, in other words, how can we sort of change the way we think about um, uh, prisons and the people that uh, we run through that system uh, to allow people to to connect in a different way to to take different uh, policy options. I think we need to change the narrative. Mm -hmm. We need to change the way that people feel about people who commit crimes. And we also need to look at the circumstances behind the crimes that are being committed. See, when you're walking into a into a under, un, undeserved community and it's trash, I often talk about this. I want to say this. I often talk about an environment that is so poorly put together. You, the, the grass is taller than the porches. The abandoned buildings are plenty. And then the people and the drugs that fills these environments. It's hard to get someone to say, oh, we should care about these people. What they saying is that they don't care about themselves. See, this has been abandoned, lack education. They can't even afford an American education. Born and raised in America, you can struggle and you can suffer, you can die in America, but you cannot have a free education in America. So how are we supposed to, to, to navigate that, though, that mindset, that hatred? We got a whole race of people not just African Americans, but brown people as well, the Hispanics, the Latinx communities. 
they suffering just the same. So you walk and they and we take pride, people take pride to say, oh, you got 15 people in one car, or you know, making sort of those sort of hatred uh, um, comments. So how do we change that? It's hard for people to 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 sit there and to not judge. And I and I honestly get, I see all the sides of it. I understand why some people turn a blind eye, but I encourage people to change the narrative. When you're seeing people going into prisons, don't just hate them. Try to figure them out, try to learn them, try to learn the psychology behind why they do the things that they do. You know, we turn, and I learned this from, from Professor Sheila Beattie, we learn how to make the abnormal normal. People where I come from tend to make what is not normal the normal behavior. And people that's outside of our communities who should know better, they accept our abnormal as normal just the same. So we got to change the whole mindset of the way we see people that are in prison. Don't be afraid to stand up, you know, and fight. You know, everyone that goes there is rehabilitation is a real thing. And you have to give them the benefit of doubt that they can change. But if you just lock them in, then where does the hope come from? And if we got a, a program like Impact who could take a person like me who come from nothing, I'm less than what beneath your shoe to a whole variety of people. And you could change me. You could make me a better man, a better person, a caring person, a person who want to go back out into society and actually rebuild the structure of things that have been destroyed, we need to change the narrative. Does any one of you want to comment on, so the, the, a few other questions were around, you know, what can we do it, with the, the system itself? And so we, you know, we talk about abolition, for example, which, which hasn't sort of traditionally been part of the conversation um, of um, the, you know, systemic racism in the prison system and the incarceration system. Um, what, what, what do you think of more sort of radical approaches that, that would um, uh, change the system potentially, um, given that we have had seemingly a hard time getting, you know, traction with, with more reformist approaches? Well, I mean, I, I think, uh, I think we got a whole, a whole other hour long webinar on that. <laughs> so I've got we'll about back in fall, to um, do what we should do an hour on. Um, I would say we need to rethink the idea of punishment as a solution to all of our social problems. Um, if punishment were what made it safe, the United States would be the safest country in the world because we lock up more than anybody else in the world. We start with police, uh, the high crime areas more than any place else in the world. The problem is not not enough police, and um, unfortunately, the commander here in Chicago just announced that he's going to double the number of police on the on the streets over the weekend. And you know that's completely in the wrong direction. The, the analogy somebody made uh, was that if Ford put out a car, half of which broke down, the way to fix it is not produce twice as many cars. The way to fix it is go back and look at your design and see what's wrong with what you're doing. And we're not doing that. So what do we need to do? The problem is not a lack of police. The problem is the lack of drug treatment, of mental health care, of schools that actually educate people, of after school programs, of summer jobs for kids, you name it. There are lots and lots of things we should be investing in instead of more and more police on the streets if we really care about being safe. And the way to look at that is we know what abolition looks like in this country. All you have to do is go to the suburbs, go to Kenilworth. It's not full of police officers on the streets every day. They have other ways of supporting their young people so that they don't commit the sorts of crimes that you see on uh, in Austin uh, or on the south side of Chicago in the, in the so-called million dollar blocks where we lock up so many people plus a million dollars a year, keep them in prison for one block. Um, so that's the solution here is invest in the things that actually build communities and that actually keep us all safe. Like Antonio said, change the narrative. 
And just to add to that, I mean, all of the data supports this. I mean, studies reliably show that there is zero connection between incarceration rates and community safety, zero. So there is no causal relationship between incarcerating people and having safer communities. But the data also shows that when we invest in things like education and communities, there's a direct connection between safer communities. So all of the data supports the obvious that if we invest in the people and the communities and the you know, kind of systems that actually support the flourishing of communities, we will be safer. And I'm, I realize we're, we're slightly over time, but I'm going to I'm going to make an executive decision and give ourselves uh, two more minutes. Um, are there are there positive examples? Are, are we uh, are there places where and I'm not so much talking about a different system um, of incarceration and criminal justice, but of a transition out of the current situation in the United States where where that actually was accomplished at least partially either within the country or elsewhere uh, that we could learn from? I mean, Norway is the answer to that one. Uh, Norway used to have a system that looked just like ours. Um, and 15 years ago or so, they, did, they gave it up, um, said that what makes us safe is not punishment. What makes us safe is strong communities. And they, they redesigned their entire prison system so that it focused on rebuilding the ties between people who had committed a crime and their social networks. So prisons there are located in communities. Um, within the prison system, it's a communal living environment so that people are relying on each other to do everything from cooking meals to uh, keeping the place clean, uh, not the sort of makeshift jobs that we have here, but real jobs inside the prison. Uh, and then everybody works in a regular job out in the community, not in the prison. Uh, they spend time on the weekends with their family and come back to the prison to sleep at night. So the idea is after you spent a relatively short amount of time, and when I say relatively short, Five years is a really long sentence in Norway. Um, after that time period is up, you are re you are reconnected to your community and you're ready to go back in with all the support you need to continue on with life in a, in a way that makes sense to you instead of violating the social norms. We know how to do it. There are models out there. They have a much lower recidivism rate than we do, a much lower crime rate than we do. Uh, in fact, corrections officials have gone over there and we're trying it on a very small level in North Dakota of all places. Um, has has been implement uh, this system so far with with decent effects. So we need to do a lot more of what they're doing. Rethink the entire way we think about public safety. And I think also just at a much smaller level, um, there are examples even in this country of closing down prisons. Um, you know, kind of some, one of the attorneys at the MacArthur Justice, Justice Center here at Northwestern had success with closing down some prisons, working to close some prisons down in the South and rehiring those some of those people, not all of them, but some of the people who were employed um, in the prisons to take on jobs in the communities. Um, and so there really is a model um, that that we've seen work for you know kind of refocusing some of those um, positions and some of that, that you know those resources to the community. So we have seen that um, we have seen that happen. Okay. Thank you. Um, now we're really on over time, so I will have to wrap it up. Um, but. Um, um, I, I'd really like to thank, thank our speakers so much for sharing their time and knowledge and insights um, with the, the Buffett community today. Um, and thanks for everyone who, who joined us for the webinar. Um, this is actually the last um, in the series that we titled Confronting COVID-19. Um, we're also excited to continue our webinar series in the fall. Um, and this will be on current global issues um, and take the form of several mini series that engage around specific uh, United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, we'll also move to uh, every other week formats. Um, so stay tuned for those announcements. Um, starting in September, we'll bring together faculty, activists, practitioner and other thought leaders to uh, talk about various aspects of um, SDG 16, which is um, peace, justice, and strong institutions. And so today's session, um, I think, leads us directly into that. So, um, uh, if our goal is to use the language of that SDG uh, to promote peaceful and inclusive societies that provide access to justice for all and build effective, accountable, and inclusive institutions to do that, um, how are we doing and um, what should be done? Um, those are the kind of questions that we try to address then. Um, so please subscribe to our mailing list if you haven't done so already. 
um, uh, for up-to-date news and um, uh, announcements about the, the series. Um, um, I wish you all a very healthy and restful um, summer and hope to see you back in fall. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Harry. Thank you.